May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable to you. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So when I first read today's lesson from Deuteronomy, I cringed. I didn't want to read it. Uh, there's a, a lectionary that goes out that all the Episcopal churches and the Methodist, Presbyterians, uh, Lutherans, uh, and most of the Roman Catholics, we follow a similar pattern in what we have. And this was the lesson for today. And the reason why I cringe about it is that I think that the church has misapplied this reading. There are two ways to read the reading from Deuteronomy. The easy way that gives you power and can look down on others who don't follow God's commands or walk in his ways. There's another way too. But first, let's get to the way that, I, that makes me cringe. So if you can turn to page uh, three, I'm going to have it read it one way. And this might sound familiar to you. So these are the words that the Lord commanded Moses to make with the Israelites. So Moses is at the end of his life. The Israelites who have, uh, if you remember way back when, the Israelites were in captivity in Egypt. They were slaves. And Moses was sent to set them free. And the Egyptian army was chasing them. They got to the sea. Moses parted it. They walked on the dry land. They crossed the other side. Uh, that they had a whirlwind to follow in, in the day. And at night, God would appear as a, as a bright burning torch that would keep them warm and give them guidance. This is where they got the Ten Commandments. This is where uh, the manna from heaven was. All of that stuff had happened. And now they are right about to cross into the promised land. And Moses is about to die. And so Deuteronomy, the last of the first five books of the Bible, uh, this is wrapping it all together. And with that, we have these words that, uh, that Moses said. And God said through Moses, today I've set before you life and what is good versus death and what is wrong. If you obey the Lord's commandments by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments, his regulations, his case laws, then you will live and thrive, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land where you're entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you refuse to listen and is so misled, I'm telling you right now, you will die. The misapplied way of reading this is where if you see somebody who is not doing well, somebody who's downtrodden, somebody who has bad luck, the church tends to judge them and say, well, if they loved the Lord and if they walked in his ways and if they followed his law, this wouldn't be happening to him. There are others that read this when they are struck by sickness or by cancer. And in one very particular case, this one parishioner I know had to get a knee replacement. And she asked about Deuteronomy 30 and said, is this because I'm not loving the Lord well enough or walking in his way? And I said, you're 85 years old. <laughs> right? <laughs> Knees have expiration dates. Thanks be to God you've lived this long, right? Um, but this is the override, this is the thing, right? Um, the whole reason why uh, the good Rabbi Kushner wrote the book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, challenging this, challenging it. Because for so long, the church has used this as a way to guide and to judge. And it's happening today, folks. There are churches out there, there are church organizations, and there are evangelists and pastors and all sorts of people out there today who are saying these people aren't following God's laws, therefore they surely will die. It's happening now. And it's wrong. If you flip over to page two, I'm going to do something I normally don't do. We have an opening collect. And that is, after I say, the Lord be with you, and also with you, let us pray. This is the opening collect, and it is a collect. It is a way of collecting the prayers that you all have had and all your concerns, everything through the week, and collecting and then putting them together. And the church dictates what our collects are, and I am going to petition my bishop that I'm never going to read this one again. Uh, and yes, you've hired a rebel. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but now, if the good right reverend says no, I mean, I'll just tell you. I'm going to read you a collect I don't agree with. And so, but this is it. Uh, this is why I don't like it. Oh God, the strength of all who put their trust in you. Awesome. I love that. Wouldn't it be great? Oh God, the, all those who put their strength and trust in you. Amen. That would be a great way to end it. But then 
The church goes on with this. And by the way, this prayer wasn't written yesterday. It wasn't written in 1979. It wasn't written in 1879. It was written a long time ago. And you will get the idea of the theology if we break it apart. Uh, So here it is. Mercifully accept our prayers. And because in our weakness, we can do nothing good without you. Give us the help of your grace that in keeping your commandments, we may please you both in will and in deed. We can please you in will and deed. Grace. Grace is God's gift to us. Grace is God's love. Grace is God's forgiveness. It is what we understand with the the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus given to us. It is unmerited. It is unearned. We cannot get rid of it. We cannot buy it. We cannot sell it. It is what is given to us. And so when we have a prayer written back before the Reformation with give us the help of your grace, then keeping your commandments, we both in will and deed please you. Mm -mm. We all fall short of the glory of God. Scripture tells us that. We're always living in a state of grace. And so how can we understand this free gift that God gives grace, and not just to us, but to everybody, all of God's people, all of them, regardless of physical or mental ability, regardless of who they love, right? This is God's love and forgiveness and peace, and it's a gift. We didn't earn it. We can't earn it. And so we have this, and keeping commandments may please you both in will and deed. And so the church then, looking at this, finding somebody who doesn't fit one of the commandments, then chastises that person. I got to baptize an adult, and she had been in a group in, in a church that she was shunned from because of particular things that she believed in. The church turned her back on her and forced her out. Now, she'd never been baptized, and one day when I was talking about God's grace, she said, wait, you mean we don't have to earn it? No. It's free. And that opened the eyes of her heart to what God is doing. And so, I don't know if I should blame, I'm probably putting too much on, on Deuteronomy, I probably shouldn't blame it so much, but this, there's another way to read this. So there's a list. If you obey the Lord God's commandments I'm giving you right now, the commandments, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments. Some would think that by keeping his commandments, his regulations, and his case laws, I don't really have to love the God of my childhood with my whole heart and strength and mind. That if I simply follow commandments and uh, tell others to do so, I don't have to walk in his ways because I'm out there self-righteously telling others how they should live. What if this was a hierarchy? What if this was number one, number two, number three? What if it was, number one, love the Lord your God. And whatever you fail after that, you love the Lord your God. Secondly, walk in his ways, knowing that you'll stumble, but walk in his ways. And number three, and follow the commandments. What if it was that? What if we hadn't flipped it upside down? And so then with Deuteronomy, typical Deuteronomy fashion, it's going to repeat itself. And so then towards the end of this, it says, uh, I have heaven and earth as my witnesses against you right now. I have set life and death, blessing and curse before you. Now choose life. And the the critic in me said, did you really have to say choose life? (laughs) So I've put blessings and I've put curse. I've put life and I've put death. Now choose life. Really? (laughs) Isn't that kind of obvious? Okay, so anyway, choose life. So you and your descendants will live by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, which is scripture, and clinging to him. Clinging to him. Uh, the verb to cling in Hebrew is the same thing that a rock climber does when, when she climbs up a rock and she's holding on to a rock for her dear life. That's the verb to cling. That is by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by clinging to him. That's how you'll survive. Some of you have been teachers. And you've told your class... To survive this class, I need you to read the assignments, I need you to do the work, and I need you to show up to class. You do that, you'll live. 
And there's always a student, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> who doesn't, and then says, you're so mean. Well, okay, so that's true, but you've had these things lined out. Uh, so when you, buy a, uh, when you buy a plant, or say we just planted a, uh, an orange tree and a lemon tree, we have a choice. We can water it, we can take care of it, and it will, hopefully, it'll grow. But our choice also is to not water it and to uh, let it decay, and then it won't grow. And so imagine that once we planted these things and we didn't do anything, and then we blame God, why didn't you make it right? Well, you had a choice. And so instead of having this Deuteronomy reading sound like an angry, vengeful God, who if you don't walk very carefully in God's ways, if you just barely step, he's going to smite you and he's going to smash you. And, and, and the more that you walk this way, the more you get to tell others what to do. And you have to carefully do this tightrope because you don't know, I'm just, I want to please God, right? I don't want to fall off. Instead of that, instead of that, what if it's grace? What if it's God's love? What if it's loving God with your whole heart? What if it's just loving your neighbor as yourself? And so if we can flip the page and then go to our Corinthians reading. Um, I, I gave you an introduction because there's a lot going on here. And one of the things is we have this guy named Apollos. And Apollos is a Greek god. Um, now, the guy that's being read about is not the Greek god, but he is named for a Greek god, which means he was not raised in a Jewish household. So he is a convert. He believed uh, he was a pagan, and now he is a believer in Christ. Uh, probably Paul converted him. It was probably some of Paul's uh, people that Paul converted that then converted Apollos. But he is a modern-day pastor. He is a modern-day uh, priest. That's what he's doing. And so uh, in those days... In Corinth, they have a very highly educated group, and if you know anything about philosophy, uh, they used to talk about who their teachers or professors were, and they would talk about who the great philosophers were, and they would say, well, I'm a part of Plato, right? I believe in Plato's believing, and then, but I'm an Aristotle kind of guy. You know, they would argue about that all the time for sport, I mean, for fun, this is what they do. Similar to how we argue today about who is a Yankees fan and who is a, let's say, a Giants fan, or, you know, um, we do that. And that's what they were doing back then. It translates into all of their life, and it's also translating into the church. And so the issue here is that Paul planted the church, and then Apollos was the worker, was the servant of God, was the pastor who was watering and caring for them. And some of the members of this church had been baptized by St. Peter, which is a pretty good deal. If you're, if you're in the church today and you can say, St. Peter baptized me, I would say you're older than CJ. Um, <laughs> but that's all right. Um, you know, that, that would be a neat thing. If Peter himself baptized you, I would tell everybody I know, right? I rented a car to Pamela Anderson. That's pretty cool, if for those of you who know who Pamela Anderson is. Uh, but you can throw these things out. And so people are like, I was baptized by Peter. Good for you. Others said, I was baptized by Paul. He only baptized five people that he knows of. And others would say, but I'm a part of Apollos, and I was baptized by Apollos, and he's the current worker here. And yet others said... I belong to Christ. There was a hierarchy in the church trying to figure out who was better than others. And if you see how the Deuteronomic uh, belief system about commandments and everything else and, and putting people in boxes and then being able to judge others and point fingers at others, if the church had a problem, you'd say, well, it's because those people belong to Apollos. If Paul was still here, he would be sitting as this direction, right? That it is causing this type of hierarchy and this type of division. And so then Paul, in, in rather harsh terms, calls them babies in Christ. I gave you milk. You couldn't handle solid food, and you can't handle it now either. It's, it seems insulting, but that's what he was talking about. When someone says, I belong to Paul, and someone else says, I belong to Apollos, aren't you acting like people without the Spirit? After all, what is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants, literally translated slaves, who helped you to believe. Each one has a role given to them by the Lord. I planted, Apollos watered, God made it grow. This is what Paul is pointing to. God is the one who makes things grow. Not out of the worthiness of the plant does God make it grow. Not out of the worthiness do we grow. 
we grow because of God's grace, because he first loved us, because he gave himself as an offering and as a sacrifice for us. This is why God makes it grow. And so with that, Paul is saying, we are the last sentence, we are co-workers, and you are God's field and God's building. Building isn't building like what we're sitting in today. Building as in building up. In another way to translate, this wouldn't work in English, which is why it's not translated that way, but it would be this. You are God's, God's farming, you are God's building up. You are God's farming and you are God's to build. Not structure with a wall and foundations, no. You are God's building up. God is working and building in you. You are God's farming. God is still planting. God is still watering. I hope in the 21st century, we can read Deuteronomy in that way. Knowing that we are God's farming and God's building up. And that we are called to love the Lord our God, to walk in his ways, and to cling to him. And so on those days when we have knee surgeries, hip surgeries, cancer surgeries, on the day when we are worried about uh, flus, when we're worried about pneumonia, when we're worried about the state of our country and its affairs, Jesus said, blessed are you. Blessed are you who are hopeless because you will be given the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who grieve because you will have joy. Blessed are you who feel harassed and beat up and tossed around. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. What if we read Deuteronomy through the rest of this century with a sense of being blessed, not because of what we do or what we follow or who baptized us or what church we go to or how many people we can gossip about or tell that they're going down the wrong path? What if instead we walked in the paths of the Lord of righteousness and joy, knowing that when we stumble, he will be there to pick us up? When we fall and when we cry, he will be there to wipe away our tears, that he will be with us through the surgeries, he will be with us through the funerals, he will be with us and guide us, and not because it's anything we ever did, but it's because he loves us that much that he gave himself for us. And so blessed are us who find uh, humility in the Lord, and then we will inherit the earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.